Hi everyone, this video is going to look at the social, moral and ethical issues surrounding um, product design and the development of products. So this is 2.3 in your uh, revision guide. Let's get into it. So firstly, what do we actually mean by social, moral and ethical issues? Well, firstly, if we look at social, <clears throat> this can range from a variety of different things. It could be to do with the environment, health, poverty, discrimination, unemployment. Basically, they are issues that affect a significant amount of people around the world. So here's some more examples of social issues. And obviously within these social issues, there are opportunities for design to help. So we're going to talk those through in a little bit more detail, but also um, designers and companies need to be quite aware of these social um, issues. So I'm going to look at those in a bit more detail later on. What do we mean by moral and ethical? Well, moral and ethical issues are linked to what people believe in. And it's pretty simple. It's down to what they believe is right or wrong. So if something is ethical, um, everyone's ethics are going to be slightly different. But it's the belief that something you are doing is either right um, or wrong. OK, we're going to move on to um, some social um, issues now. This is something that you need to have an awareness. So big corporations, really big businesses have this thing called uh, co corporate social responsibility becoming much more important nowadays due to uh, companies needing to look a lot more environmentally friendly to be seen as to be doing something about the environment. So I've got some examples here for you. Um, Lego, um, as they predominantly use polymers in, the, in their products, they have pledged to stop using crude oil-based plastics by 2030. So they are going to be going down the biopolymer route. And they have made that pledge by 2030. I mean, that's a huge um, pledge because biopolymers can be used in similar ways, but they don't have all the properties that certain, the, definitely the, the ABS, the polymers that, that Lego use currently. So that will take a lot of work from Lego, but that's what they've pledged to. And they've also committed to be 100% renewable energy um, in, in the future. So you can see that they're making a big effort to reduce their carbon footprint and their impact um, on the environment. They are also in partnership, partnership with the World Wildlife Fund and they are involved in researching ways of reducing emissions. So, yes, this can be seen as a bit of a marketing ploy um, for people to see that they are, um, you know, trying to be more environmentally friendly. It might actually help with their sales and make them look better in terms of their publicity. But they are considering their corporate social responsibility and taking these steps to make improvements. Disney also has a relatively good reputation for CSR, corporate social responsibility. They encourage their employees to be involved in charity work. They provide a lot of support to people involved in things like natural disasters, such as earthquakes. And they on the Disney Channel, they actually have a lot of natural kind of history films, lots of um, nature documentaries. And with the funds raised from those documentaries, they actually do a lot of um, planting of trees in rainforests. So they are doing their bit to give back um, and potentially make themselves look better in the eye of the uh, public. So corporate social responsibility and a couple of, of examples there for you. Um, OK, this one's a little bit of a random one, but this is all to do with things being moral and things being ethical. So. Products that are designed for military use are often criticised as having detrimental social effects. So lots of the products that are being developed for the military, you could say that they are morally wrong in terms of they are being used to hurt people. Now, what's quite interesting is that these military products have actually led to the development of a really wide range of products that are now considered to have a lot of positive um, benefits. So I've got some examples here for you. 
Um, this thing here called the pill can um, is actually something that you swallow. It's not as big as that, so that's not to scale. It's a lot smaller, but there's a little camera in there that internally um, takes pictures as it, as it travels throughout your body and it can be used to detect the early signs of cancer. This technology was first used in missile guidance technology. So you can see that the development of that technology, although morally wrong at first, potentially, is now being used in a product that could be saving a lot of people's lives. Um, radar is another example used a lot in air travel safety nowadays, um, but it was refined and developed in World War II to spot obviously enemy uh, aircraft, but it's now used a lot in air travel safety. I didn't actually know this, but the EpiPen, which is obviously used to treat life-threatening allergic re reactions, things like anaphylactic shock, and my husband actually uses a type of EpiPen to treat a condition that he has. Um, this was actually uh, initially used as a way for soldiers to protect themselves from things like chemical attacks and nerve agents. So if they were um, told or were aware that <coughs> a chemical had been released against them, they could use one of these EpiPens to inject themselves with some medicine that would help protect them from that. So that's where the EpiPen comes from. And obviously now that is massively beneficial um, in terms of where that technology is now being used. There are some other examples. So uh, GPS, um, obviously used in lots of travel and um, well, lots of different ways of uh, keeping track of where things are. Penicillin is one of the most uh, common anti, uh, what are they called? I want to say antibacterial, but it's not that, is it? Uh, it's gone completely out of my head, but used to obviously treat uh, viruses and things like that was developed in the war. Drones were developed in the war. Uh, jet engine, the development of jet engine, jet engines massively improved in during the war, as well as things like nylon and other synthetic materials. The use of these was developed throughout um, World War One and World War Two and are now being used for lots of other beneficial uses um, in the world. Hope that makes sense. So as well as, um, you know, products being made for moral and ethical uh, purposes, and also companies having a corporate responsibility for um, how they are behaving and what they are doing in terms of the environment, Companies are also looking for alternative material sources that are non-finite. Um, this could be to do with ethical production methods or just making sure that they are having more sustainable materials. So making sure that you're moving away from crude oil polymers and towards things like biopolymers. Making sure that you are using something called FSC timbers. So FSC stands for Forest Stewardship Council. You might want to make a note of this. Um, it looks like a little tree with like a with like a tick. Now this is a terrible picture that I'm drawing, but it's something like this. And it means that the, the timbers that you are using are coming from a sustainably managed forest. So an example of a terribly managed forest would be the rainforest because it's not managed at all. It's just being stripped out. But FSC, this corporation, was well, not a corporation, it's an organisation, actually ensure that woods and things are coming from places where the, the timber is being replanted, indigenous tribes are being respected, um, biodiversity is being maintained, and it just ensures that the forests are being cared for. Um, Another thing that companies need to think about is the safe extraction of metals. There was a terrible thing that happened in Brazil in 2015, where a dam collapsed around a metal um, mine and hundreds of people were killed. So, you know, the extraction of metals can be very, very, um, very dangerous and also linking that with working conditions you can have people going into mines for things like diamonds i know that's not a metal uh, for diamonds but also things like uh, something called tantalum which i've mentioned before this is a, a rare 
uh, metal that's used in mobile phones. And that is being mined um, potentially by young people. Their working conditions can be very poor. So, you know, corporations need to consider where their materials are coming from and they need to make sure that that's not having a negative impact, um, you know, socially and ethically. OK, something else that they need to think about. I'm just going to rub these little bits out that are uh, overlapping here. Something else that um, designers and companies need to think about is they need to make sure that they are not offending people in different parts of the world. So um, I realise that this PowerPoint's a little bit all over the place, but so is the chapter in the book, to be honest. Um, they need to think about are the, the, the designs, the colours, the decorations, are they culture, culturally acceptable? So you might not be able to see this very well, but colours in different parts of the world mean completely different things. So there's a really good example where an airline wants... Um, airline gave out white carnation flowers um, to um, to customers as they got onto the plane as a bit of a celebration um, and it it means um, happiness in places like Australia and the United States but in um, East Asia it means death which is not the best thing to give to someone as they get onto an airplane um, so there are lots of different um, things that mean different, um, you know, have different meanings in different places. So I know that it's extremely rude to point in places like Japan. Um, so you need to make sure that your products are culturally acceptable and in different cultures around the world, they are not going to be offensive. OK, so from that, we're now going to swap to making sure that products are inclusive. So, you know, this is moral. This considers social issues because a large people in in the world have a disability. And it's extremely important that design includes these people and make sure that products can be used by them. So the British Standards Institute defines inclusive design as the design of mainstream products or services that can be accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible. So this means that products and, um, you know, services such as a, um, you know, going through an airport, um, going into shops, um, those can be used as much as possible by a wide range of people, people with the kind of people that you might be considered might have a physical disability. Um, they might have uh, they might be visually impaired. They could have a, a hearing um, deficit. So there's lots of different things that need to be considered. But also, I think this little um, image is quite interesting. You might you might be designing for someone who is physically disabled, so maybe has one arm. But the product that you develop, if it can be used by someone with one arm, is also going to be great for someone who has an arm injury or also a new parent who is constantly carrying around their little person, uh, a baby, and they might only be able to use one one arm. So quite often products that are designed for um, products that are designed to be inclusive and specifically for um, people with disabilities actually have massive benefits for a, a wide range of people and just the general population. So um, another important part of inclusive design is that the, the products do not stigmatise. They do not make them feel uh, conscious or kind of make it really obvious that they are designed for people with a disability. So there are some good examples of this. One of the best examples of um, something that was designed for people with um, grip issues, so it could be arthritis or anything like that. These OXO good grips were designed for people with disabilities, but actually have just become a mainstream product because everyone likes a chunkier grip. It makes it easier for everyone. So you'll see these types of products. Um, John Lewis sell them. You'll see them all over the place. And they are a really good example of how inclusive design can be beneficial to everyone. 
Um, there's also some other examples, things like wider doors in um, new homes that are being built. So wheelchairs can be um, can easily go through them and things like hearing induction loops in cinemas and theatres. So now people can um, access that no matter if they have a, vis um, a, uh, a hearing problem. Last thing I want to talk about on this page is this thing called empathic research. Now, sometimes it can be difficult for designers to understand how someone with a disability would interact with a product. So empathic research can sometimes be carried out. And this is a good example. This rather shocked looking guy is, you, is wearing these gloves, which would simulate how someone with arthritis, how their hands might be stiffer or more difficult to bend, more inflexible. And these gloves actually help to redesign um, how to open a top of a pill bottle. So by doing this empathic research, so empathy means to understand the emotion or the feeling of someone else. Um, this empathic research helps you understand how a disabled user would find the use of your product. I did this in my degree. I taped up my hands. I put Vaseline on a pair of glasses so it was difficult to see. So that's called empathic research. Right, last couple of slides I'm going to go through relatively quickly. Um, designers often um, design for um, people that might be in a third world. And sometimes design does not have to be for a profit. It can be for the benefit of others. So I've got some examples here of products that were designed to help others and they were not designed to make a profit or to compete with the market. They were purely to be used to solve a social issue. So these issues being either mostly poverty in in third world sort of countries like Africa, South America, um, places like that. So one of the most famous examples is this guy called Trevor Bayliss. He created the wind up radio that was used in um, Africa where basically they, they could not get um, electricity. So this wind up radio um, really helped with communication across um, areas of Africa, helped with education specifically to do with um, AIDS. So there was a lot of medical information going out over the radio, lots of warnings, lots of health statements that were just not being easily communicated to people in Africa. So Trevor Bayliss, legend, um, invented this wind up radio where you literally just turn a handle and it produces enough electricity for um, this radio to work. Um, another example is the use of crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding brings together obviously lots of different people that would pay money into a central pot which allowed products to be made that maybe did not have commercial viability or um, a commercial need. So crowdfunding was used to produce this thing, which is called the gravity light. You do not know, you don't need to know how it works, but it basically uses a weight um, to produce energy and used massively in Kenya where fuel for things like lights was just not available and was too expensive for families. And this gravity light, which was supplied completely free to these people, helped to solve that problem. Um, Yanko Design, which is a website that I like to use, they launched competitions over the years to design products that solved problems faced by the poor. One of the winning ideas in a past competition was rainwater collection systems. They've also created things for, um, you know, shelters for the poor. Um, so, you know, websites and competitions on, of, um, often launch these kind of um, initiatives to design products that are specifically to so solve these kind of um, issues. Um, the issue that can happen, though, is intellectual property, which protects designs, can sometimes be a real issue because it means that if someone comes up with a really fancy idea, say this gravity light, if this was protected by IP, it would mean that it couldn't be shared or used across the world by different, uh, different um, companies, which would be ridiculous because it would mean that you were limiting how many people could use that product and limiting the benefit 
on the world. So lots of lots of companies do this, but specifically this this place, this organization called Practical Action, they with anything they design, they have an open design strategy, which means anything they come up with is called open source is another way of saying it as well. Some of you may have heard of that uh, open source uh, programs and things that can be downloaded. But open source design means anyone can use that design um, for the benefit of others. So that's a little bit about how design is um, benefiting um, in places where people are poor. There are also things where it's benefiting in health and well-being. So if we go on to the next slide. Technology and medicine, absolutely massive. So things like the design of prosthetics have become a lot more advanced due to new materials like carbon fiber, reinforced plastic. Um, also, the development of something called uh, shape memory alloy, which is a smart material which can move in reaction to um, heat or electric current. Um, if anyone watches Grey's Anatomy, you might have heard of this thing called the Da Vinci. This is a robot um, which can do, um, which can basically do surgery uh, automatically or can be controlled by a surgeon. But it means that minimally invasive surgery is now available. Over the years, the development of the MRI and CT scans have transformed the way that doctors can treat patients. You can see injuries a lot more clearly. Artificial organs are now starting to be produced. Um, hearts and co cochlear implants can be developed because of technology, which are helping people to hear for the first time. Um, and 3D printing is also having a big impact on the medical world. Um, for example, things like ceramic support for bone growth, synthetic skin is starting to be grown, um, polymer skull repairs. This is because 3D printing can be completely custom for the, di the different people um, who might be needing to access it. Also, things just like models, like this heart model here, are going to help massively in medical education. Uh, bizarrely, we've actually got this 3D printer in school as well. But technology is having a massive impact in medicine. Um, the last slide. This slide focuses on a big social impact that's happening at the moment. People from places like Ukraine um, and the Middle East, people are migrating um, due to war, due to um, lots of different, uh, it could be poverty, it could be um, a dictatorship, something like that. So designers have also responded to the needs of migrants and their needs are food and water, clothing, housing and medical care. So things like food and water, things like solar cooking equipment and water filtration have been created to help with that issue. Um, donating discarded clothing for refugees. And also this lady here called Angela Luna, she has developed a range of fashion actually specifically for refugees. So one of her pieces of um, fashion, I think it might be this one, is a cape. It actually turns into a tent, which is amazing. So she designed a whole range of fashion um, items that specifically meet the needs of refugees. Um, Ikea designed this flat pack um, shelter for refugees and medical care. Um, a uh, designers created shipping containers that could turn into mini hospitals. So again, you can see how designers are meeting the needs of this social problem, which is to do with war, which is to do with poverty, all different types of things happening. But designers are stepping in to help meet the needs of these people.